A couple of reviews of the Ambassadors of Death from the old DWRG. Firstly, from David Masters on the 26th of the 7th, 97. Despite the fact that the amount of rewriting the story underwent is quite apparent in the finished product, I have a great deal of affection for it. It inhabits a similar world to that of the James Bond genre, more so than any of its predecessors or successors, and contains a number of the same flaws, such as the unclear motivation of some characters such as Tal Talion, and the same sort of charm. The atmosphere of menace generated around the alien ambassadors impelled to the dirty work of Regan is especially effective, as is the build-up to their appearance. The major flaw is the conceptual jump, likely a side effect of the constant script revisions in the final episode as Carrington is rather blandly revealed to be the master villain. Although it was pretty obvious by then, the lack of dramatic flourish surrounding his unmasking is surprising given some of the excesses in the earlier hijack action scenes. Both Whitaker, the story's originator, and Hulk, who unaccredited, finished the project. Are writers always better suited to the longer stories as this allowed them to explore and breathe life into their ideas, and Ambassadors is testament to this. I dare say that it could have been cut down by an episode of three, but it would not have been quite the same. And now from Tom May on the 7th for the 5th, 98, the final proof that all of season seven was great. The Doctor, I don't know what came down in Mars Probe 7, but it certainly wasn't human. Upon finally settling down to watch a black and white copy of The Ambassadors of Death, I expected something good, but not up to the standards of Inferno, I was wrong. The Ambassadors of Death is a truly excellent epic narrative, detailing humanity's first contact of alien life in the form of the alien ambassadors. The aliens aren't quite what they initially seem to be in the first four episodes. There are classic scenes of the massive and eerie space suited ambassadors towering over Lennox, a familiar act of those who know the tomb of the Cybermen, and of course the guard in the famous scene with the sun behind the ambassador as it marches onward, oblivious to bullets. The musical theme for the ambassador's presence is majestic and hard to explain. I seem to recall Dudley Simpson coming up with vaguely similar music towards the end of The Fury from the Deep. The musical soundtrack for this definitely should be commercially released along with Inferno and Fury. The characters, while not all superb, e.g. Taltalian's unclear motives and changing accent and the dull Ralph Cornish are very nicely created by Whitaker, especially General Carrington, a subtle different style of general than I'm used to seeing in Doctor Who. His motivations, xenophobia, are real and relevant today and I simply adore the final scene where the Doctor delivers his verdict on Carrington. The style of the story is unique, yet vaguely reminiscent of Bond movies, particularly in the amusing chase of Liz Shaw, witness her outrageous fashion sense, and part for his vaguely literal cliffhanger. Yeah, that's that's a cursed one, all right. Caroline John is supremely convincing, intelligent, and fanciable, for me anyway, and as ever has a good rapport with Pertwee's doctor. Pertwee is on top form here, acting as a mediator, and not so much as a man of action in this adventure, which is surprisingly considering the high action content. Unit is in its prime here, with the Brigadier unflappable, and a return appearance from Sergeant Benton. While the truly great scenes in this story all invariably contain the superb ambassadors, it's generally very easy to watch all the way through. While it is padded, the padding adds to the suspense and to the epic feel of the production. I'd recommend this story wholeheartedly for anyone to watch, especially perhaps someone new to Doctor Who.